Good morning and welcome to the launch preview of the Footprint Intelligence Better Meat Report in association with the Sorry, RSPCA. Sorry, I was there. Sure. Now, meat consumption is one of the most composite components in the sustainability debate. And it was our aim to unpick the complexities of one of the biggest challenges faced by the food industry and offer some form of a roadmap to better meat consumption. The output of months and months of work is an incredibly exciting report that will be of huge value to the industry. The report will land in your inbox and the industries at large at one o'clock this afternoon. And we urge you to circulate it as widely as possible in your own organizations and hopefully beyond. Without the support of the RSPCA Shore, this project would not have happened. So it gives me great pleasure to hand over to John Kerslake, Chief Operating Officer of the RSPCA, uh, before Nick Hughes, Associate Editor of Footprints and indeed one of the authors of the report, will present the findings of the research uh, and then moderate a fascinating panel with some true thought leaders in this debate. Um, so, John, thank you again and over to you. Thank you, Charlie. And a big thank you to you all for joining us today for the launch of the Caterer's Guide to Better Meat. I'd like to extend a particular thanks to the panellists who will shortly be discussing some of the key aspects of the report and sharing their experience of sourcing better meat. Our vision here at the RSPCA is to live in a world where all animals are respected and treated with compassion. Many of you will know us predominantly for our rescuing and rehoming of animals, as well as our advocacy work. But the welfare of farmed animals is also key to what we do. We work to improve the lives of farmed animals in a number of ways, including through our campaigning on key issues such as the banning of live exports, as well as the development of our market-leading RSPCA welfare standards, which are now used as best practice globally. In 1994, we established the Freedom Food Scheme to certify farmers and supply chains of these welfare standards. We also pioneered the labelling of higher welfare products to reassure consumers. Six years ago, we rebranded our certification scheme to RSPCA Assured, building on the trust and consumer awareness of the wider RSPCA. 96% of consumers recognise the RSPCA brand, meaning that in a sea of labels, customers instantly associate the RSPCA Assured label with high animal welfare. The label continues to grow from strength to strength, with over 1,300 retail products now carrying it. Farm membership continues to grow too, and now includes more than a third of UK pig farms, and over 90% of Scottish salmon and UK free range egg farms who are currently certified by the scheme. As Charlie mentioned when introducing me, I've worked with the food service sector for many years. Firstly, at Cadbury and Green and Grax as a supplier to the sector, and then master the whip bread in both Premier Inn and Costa as a customer. Because of this, I understand only too well the competing professionals on our margin you all face, face, plus the constant requirement to have a competitive advantage in innovation in your offices. These pressures have been amplified by the unprecedented change in the people we've all seen over the last two years. But I know, speaking to former colleagues and also to our food service partners, that many, many companies take the opportunity to reflect on how they learn from these experiences and build back better, to coin a well known phrase. This is why we have partnered with Footprint on this report. As you've all demonstrated by joining today's call, there is a strong desire in the sector to source best and meat. We know that there are potential barriers. And we, we hope, hope that through the findings and suggestions in this report, you may identify opportunities on how to make sourcing better meat a reality. Our RSPCA and the wider RSPCA are here to support you on these journeys whenever when you're ready, ready to begin. begin. Thank, Thank you once again, again for joining, joining today. today. I'll hand back over now, now to Charlie and Nick, who will take you through a summary, summary of the report. report. Good morning, everyone. I'm Nick Hughes, Footprints Associate Editor and co author of the Caterer's Guide to Better Meat, along with my colleague David Burrows. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with you today some of the key findings from the research. And today's launch feels especially timely for a few reasons. First, and perhaps most obviously, we are at the start of arguably the most important climate summit or indeed global summit on any issue in history. 
And as I'm sure you're all aware, the way that we produce and consume food, and meat and dairy in particular, is a significant contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Last week, of course, the UK government launched its own net zero strategy in which food and agriculture received comparably little attention compared with some other issues. And so it feels like businesses will need to continue driving the shift to more sustainable food systems in the absence of a strong government lead. Related to that, we've recently seen the conclusion of a trade agreement in principle with New Zealand, which like the Australia deal before it, didn't provide the guarantees of a level playing field for imported foods, including meats, that British farmers and a large cohort of the British public have been demanding. Food service has long been a route to market for overseas meat, sometimes produced to lower standards than are required in the UK. And so this is something we'll need to watch closely in the years ahead. And to illustrate that point, the Soil Association's new Out to Lunch survey published just yesterday found just three out of a survey, 20 high street restaurant chains served 100% British meat. And a lot of menus contained lower welfare imported meat. And Rob Percival from the Soil Association will I'm sure expand on those findings in our panel Q&A session later. So on to the findings from the report, which, as with footprint intelligence reports more generally, is a narrative driven piece of work rooted in a commercial context rather than a systematic review of the evidence. And I shall go through the report's main findings in sequence. First, I'll take a look at the context for Better Meat and why we're talking about it now. I'll then consider the current state of the food service market where meat sourcing is concerned. I'll then look at how we might define better meat and we'll conclude with some of the challenges caterers face in sourcing better meat and finally how those challenges can be overcome. So why are we talking about better meat specifically? Well the simple answer is the way we produce and consume meat currently is linked with some of the world's most urgent environmental and health crises, including climate change, loss of biodiversity, and anti antimicrobial resistance. And it's against this backdrop that businesses are coming under pressure from campaigners and increasingly investors too, to ensure not only that they serve less meat overall, but that the meat they do serve is of a higher quality, more sustainable environmentally, and produced to high welfare standards. And if we think about what tends to be uppermost in the public's mind when they consider the environmental impacts of meat consumption, it's increasingly climate change. A paper in the journal Nature Food published earlier this year found that food systems are responsible for a third of global anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions. And livestock consistently comes out as the greatest contributor of total food system emissions in life cycle assessments. Pound for pound, it's ruminant livestock, specifically cattle and sheep, that are commonly identified as the greatest contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, more so than poultry and pigs. But as we note in the report, the evidence is fiercely contested. For example, the Sustainable Food Trust's Patrick Holden told us that livestock reared in extensive mixed farming systems could play a major role in addressing climate change by taking carbon out of the atmosphere via sequestration. That's partly why more recently we've also seen poultry and pig meat come under the spotlight with production of those proteins often reliant on cereal based feed sourced from environmentally vulnerable parts of the world such as the Amazon basin. In the report, we reference a piece of work commissioned by the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission to model the feasibility of feeding the nation through a shift to agroecological farming methods. And the diets it came up with significantly reduces pork and chicken consumption, with beef seeing a relatively smaller reduction and sheep held constant as a result of their role in nutrient cycling and fertility building in mixed farming systems. So there, are, so there are no simple answers, as much as perhaps we wish there were. 
the impact of meat production is nuanced and it varies depending on the production process and what you are actually measuring. Cattle and sheep may perform worse when looking purely through an emissions lens, but when you factor in the impact of the end to end production process on biodiversity and fertilizer use, for instance, challenges then start to emerge around pork and chicken supply chains. And even within individual protein sources, there can be huge differences based on methods of production. For cattle, intensive feedlot systems can look great in carbon footprint analysis versus pasture raised, but far less so in terms of animal welfare or nutrient cycling or antibiotic use. And I think that's part of the reason why the issue has been so divisive. Not only is the science contested, but meat is not produced equally. Impacts at a farm level and throughout the value chain vary hugely based on a series of choices made by various actors, not least the farmer. It's not unreasonable that a farmer producing high quality meat to high environmental standards would consider simple messages around the need to eat less meat as reductive. And yet campaigners know that it's simple messages that most effectively cut through the noise and persuade people to change their eating habits. And that's where this notion of less and better meat comes into the discussion. And chapter three of the report considers what better might look like in a food service context. But before we get into that, we've looked at the current state of the food service market and what kind of meat tends to make its way into food service supply chains. The first thing to say is that data on the meat procured by food service companies is limited. There are statistics on volumes, for instance, but very little if you want to dig beneath that into provenance, certification, production methods and greenhouse gas emissions. In September last year, Footprint surveyed 25 companies, including some of the largest food, fast food chains, contract caterers, pub and hotel groups on the provenance of the meat they buy. Across those firms that provided data, 90% of the beef comes from the UK and Ireland, compared to 70% of the chicken, 69% of the lamb, and just 58% of the pork. Now, this survey only captured data from some of the English industry's biggest players, and we know that food service is a hugely fragmented sector. And I think it's safe to assume that the deeper you dive into the market, the murkier things get in terms of the transparency of meat supply chains and the quality of meat being served. We have, however, seen a number of companies take positive steps in relation to the meat they provide. On the high street, Nando's and KFC have both won qualified praise for recent improvements to their chicken sourcing. Both have committed to the better chicken commitment, which requires, among other things, a shift to slower growing breeds. McDonald's has also taken steps to increase transparency around its meat supply chains including by publishing a map showing where its beef, pork and eggs come from, right down to the farm level. As a general rule, we find that farm assured or red tractor meat remains the go to standard for many companies in the food service sector. But we suspect that an awful lot of meat doesn't even make that great. In certain areas, businesses have gone beyond those more baseline assurance standards. There have been moves among contract caterers in particular to commit to cage-free egg production, and many commitments go further still with free range the target. The market penetration of RSPCA assured laying hens, for example, is now 50, 51%. For pork, it's 26%. However, there are still issues over processed or liquid eggs, which make up 20% of the UK market and still often come from regions where battery cages are still legal. Outside of eggs and pork, things start to drop off, specifically where RSPCA assured certification is concerned. For chickens, penetration is just over 1%, and for RSPCA assured beef and lamb, it's under 0.1%. Now, clearly, there are other certification schemes available, and with red meat in particular, schemes or labels aren't the only proxy for good sustainability practices. 
But there is a general lack of transparency around the provenance of meat and food service. There's currently no requirement to label the country of origin for meat served in the catering environment, unlike for food sold through retail, albeit the government has recently outlined plans for new animal welfare labels that are in scope of the out of home sector. Generally, however, transparency is low, and in particular with animal feed, it's nigh on impossible to know with any certainty whether the production of meat has contributed to deforestation due to the labyrinthine nature of supply chains for, for animal feeds such as soya. So what does better meat look like? Our expert panel will share their own perspectives on this shortly. But in the report itself, we've looked at the evidence, including attempts by organisations like the Eating Better Alliance to define what better meat looks like in a food service context and highlight some of the key principles. We don't try to replicate that work in the report, but we do provide links so that you can read it for yourself. And we also try to draw out some key conclusions of relevance to caterers. Now, the first thing to say is that our own personal definition of meat and better meat will be inherently partial and reflect our own priorities, whether that is carbon emissions or animal welfare or simply the cost or the taste of meat. In the report, we quote experts from the Stockholm Resilience Centre who say that definitions of better meat are highly context specific and depend on a multitude of aspects that have to be jointly assessed. The simple answer would be to narrow the focus down to a limited number of environmental indicators, or just one, climate impact. And as I noted previously, chicken and pork with their lower emissions per kilo would look good against beef and lamb, but then not all red meat is produced equally. Many British farmers believe their meat is better than that produced elsewhere, given the reliance on grass fed systems, which means inedible biomass like grass can be turned into high value protein. So data that lumps together geographical regions or entire systems or that focuses on a limited number of environmental indicators can be misleading. Tesco's own analysis of emissions from its products found that eggs from caged birds had considerably lower carbon footprints than those from organic systems. But you'd be hard pressed to find too many people who would argue cage systems are inherently better. So how do you balance those trade-offs? Well, one way is you try to build a comprehensive picture of the different impacts of different production systems and then try to identify a method of production that best optimizes them all. And there's plenty of work happening in this space, as we've reported on previously, with the aim of producing one simple environmental score or even a label on the back of that work. But as the Oxford of, University of Oxford professor Sir Charles Godfrey is quoted in the report as saying, we need much better data on all these issues and better ways to track what we eat back to how it is produced. And until the quality of that farm level data improves, food service companies are likely to continue leaning on certification schemes as a proxy for better meat. And with good reason, the message of those schemes tends to be simple and the schemes are generally reliable. The challenge consumers and businesses face is in navigating what those labels do and don't deliver. Certification schemes are often single issue, or if they focus on more than one issue, they rarely cover the whole range of impacts, both social and environmental. And as we've heard already, you've got to tick more than one box to get true sustainability. And that includes supporting rural communities and farmer livelihoods and small suppliers and ensuring producing, producing meat is economically sustainable, which is far from a given in the current commercial environment. There are also intrinsic factors in how people perceive better meat, such as flavour, juiciness, eating quality and health that we don't cover in the report, but these have to be taken into consideration in a real world business context. I mentioned earlier Eating Better and their Sourcing Better Guide, which is arguably the most comprehensive attempt yet to build alignment on the issues and impact areas on what constitutes better meat. 
The guide spans animal welfare, antibiotic use, greenhouse gas emissions, land use change, soil health, local pollution and water scarcity. And for each indicator, offers three tiers relating to how meat is produced, basic, better and best, which can help businesses weigh up where they currently rank against these indicators and where they need to improve. We also need to be careful that sustainability claims are based on fact and concepts are not co-opted in pursuit of corporate sustainability commitments. A lot of recent net zero pledges, for example, set ambitions around a shift to sourcing food and meat, in particular from regenerative farming systems. But that's not a term that has been readily defined and there's a lack of agreed indicators about what outputs farming has to deliver to be considered truly regenerative. So in summary, the task of defining better meat is still a work in progress. And while there's growing agreement over the need at a population level to eat less meat overall, I sense the debate over defining better meat has only just begun, albeit some core principles are starting to emerge. So if we move on now to the challenges in sourcing better meat. When asked to identify through our research the main barriers to sourcing better meat, food service operators consistently offer two, cost and availability. As a general point of principle, the higher the specifications regarding the environment and animal welfare, the more expensive and less available that meat product is. Food service operators ultimately are beholden to what the customer is willing to pay for meat, whether that's the general public or a contract catering client. And while some people may be willing to pay a premium for free range or organic chicken, for instance, household budgets and those of public and private sector catering clients are often prohibited. And that price piece becomes even more challenging in a food service setting, where there is often little opportunity or desire on the part of the client to communicate around provenance. Compare a chicken curry served up in a workplace restaurant with the fresh chicken fixture at a major supermarket. At the supermarket, as a customer, you'll be able to compare the price of various tiers of chicken that balance your budget with your values. That kind of choice and information is simply not available in a food service setting. And so the incentive for the caterer to pay a premium for better quality chicken simply might not be there. Even when meat is certified to a higher standard, it may not be advertised as such in certain food service settings. Where labelling loose or component products is more challenging, origin labelling is not a legal requirement, and for contract caterers, the client's appetite to promote sustainability may not always be high. Availability is another key barrier for businesses that we have identified. Supply of the highest grade meats, including certified products, is often gobbled up by supermarkets who have invested over many years in establishing direct producer relationships, leaving food service operators to compete for the remaining marginal volume. And building that extra supply is a challenge. The majority of caterers consider themselves too small to hold direct, produ di direct producer relationships, and therefore supply chains can be long and labyrinthine, involving a combination of processors, importers, wholesalers, specialist caterers, catering butchers. Each of these plays an important role in providing a regular supply of consistent products to the required specifications, but the distance between producer and seller means individual food service operators often have little influence over what happens at a farm level and therefore little opportunity to drive an improvement in standards on the ground. And from the producer's perspective, in order to invest in the necessary improvements in their production systems to achieve higher certification or standards, farmers require certainty in future demand, which is not always offered by food service customers who buy through intermediaries. And this can create a chicken and egg situation where food service operators want to be sure there is sufficient supply of a higher standard product 
before committing to changes in procurement. But producers won't invest the time and money in converting without assurances that there will be an end market for that product. The length and complexity of many food service meat supply chains also presents real challenges around transparency. Data around origin, production methods, welfare standards, etc. It's very difficult to get hold of. Many food, so food service operators have little end to end visibility over what animals are being fed and how they are being reared, which in turn makes environmental reporting challenging and increases it companies exposure to risks around deforestation or poor welfare practices. The notion that by buying less meat, you can spend more on the meat you do buy is popular among NGOs. However, our research suggests that it doesn't translate easily into a commercial setting. One caterer told us they hadn't had any requests for a higher specification meat because they are buying less of it. Another said the notion that serving less meat allows you to trade up to more ethically produced meat has not yet come into the vocabulary of their customers. So we need to be careful that neat theories like less and better meat translate into a commercial setting. And those organisations promoting these messages need to work with businesses to understand how it can work in practice. A final point on the challenges is around public procurement. The government spends two billion pounds every year buying food and catering services, which presents a huge opportunity to grow demand for better meat. However, if anything, current buying standards are considered to be an impediment. The House of Commons Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee published a report earlier this year, which concluded that the government had largely failed to improve food production standards, animal welfare, and sustainability through the standards it sets for public sector food. And what standards there are tend to be poorly monitored and enforced. Current procurement standards often go no further than the UK legal baseline, while leaving the door ajar to imports produced to inferior standards. And this risk will potentially be exacerbated under the terms of new trade deals currently being negotiated with countries like Australia and New Zealand, unless public procurement rules are tightened significantly to require meat sourced for the public sector to meet UK legal standards as a minimum. Allied to this is a lack of origin labelling requirements for meat, with, for meat, with the result being there's a fear that food service can be an opportunity to bring in poor standard meat through the back door. So how can all of these challenges be overcome? Well, the barriers to buying better meat, they are many, they are genuine, but they're not insurmountable. We're already seeing some of the UK's biggest contract catering companies redesign menus to increase the proportion of vegetables and plant based proteins and give meat a more supporting role on the plate rather than always casting it as the central character. In many cases, the better part of the less and better equation is still missing, but our sense through our research, both for this report and our forthcoming net zero report, is that businesses are committed to changing their sourcing practices to favour more local produce and food, including meat, produced from regenerative agricultural systems. Where meat is being replaced with plant-based ingredients, those alternatives have to be at least as attractive if not more attractive in flavour or value than the meat they're replacing. Generating customer demand for dishes containing less meat mustn't just rely on people's sense of morality. Those dishes have to excite customers and be promoted for their superior taste and flavour. Businesses can also stimulate customer demand for better meat by telling a compelling story about its provenance. Last year, more than a million people signed a petition calling on the government to protect British food standards in future trade deals. So clearly there's a desire among the public to support farmers producing better meat and those businesses selling it. Caterers serving meat produced to higher standards need to get better at telling the story behind it and where they have an institution like a hospital or school or business between them and the end consumer. They need to make the case for why that client should talk openly 
about qualities such as provenance and sustainability and help them develop bespoke communications at the point of service. If you do it and you don't tell anyone about it, then from a commercial perspective, you're not driving the additional benefit, as one, as one caterer told us. So use your communications to educate people about what better meat looks like. Use farmer case studies as examples. Promote the fact that pasture raised beef, for example, is not only better for the environment, it tastes better too. Caterers that build a reputation based on sourcing better ingredients, including meats, can expect to unlock commercial benefits, both in terms of customer retention and new customer acquisition. We've been told this in practice by caterers, not just theoretically, uh, and we may hear more of this from WSH's Kevin Dunford during the panel session. One of the easiest ways to tell the story of the meat on the plate is through certification schemes like RSPCA Assured, like Pasture for Life, like Organic. These schemes provide robust proxies for sustainability in a way that is both recognisable and understandable to consumers. Businesses starting off with basic farm assurance standards can look to work their way up the ladder to achieve higher standards as their ambition involves and supply challenges are unlocked. You don't have to do everything at once. Start with protein sources where certified produce is more readily available, for example, eggs and pork, and then steadily increase your level of ambition. Campaigners on the whole are not expecting the shift to better meat to happen overnight. On the challenge of availability, closing that supply gap for better meat may in future require food service operators to establish closer relationships with producers and make ends to end supply chain transparency part of their business proposition. Those businesses that establish closer relationships with producers can exert greater influence over how their meat is produced. And by giving producers long term certainty of supply, caterers can give them confidence to make investments needed to lift standards. As supply increases, the price of better quality meat should come down. We've already seen this happen in the case of eggs, where a whole scale shift to free range shell eggs in recent years has seen that price differential with cage eggs narrow rapidly. The final point to make is that for all the commercial benefits that can be unlocked by buying better meat, just as compelling is the sustainability and reputational case for change. Barely a month passes without an investigation linking the meat or dairy in our supermarkets or restaurants to deforestation on the other side of the world. Sourcing better meat from short, transparent supply chains will help mitigate some of those business risks whether that's deforestation, sourcing from areas of water scarcity or welfare or labour abuses in supply chains. Ultimately, the shift to better meat is about building long term resilient supply chains. The sooner businesses move in this direction, the more they stand to reap the commercial benefits. So thank you for listening. I hope that was a useful digest ahead of reading the report itself. And I'm now delighted to introduce our panel for a Q&A. Cleona Duffy is Head of Commercial Partnerships at RSPCA Assured. Kevin Dunford is Senior Purchasing Manager at Westbury Spirit Street Holdings. And Rob Percival is Head of Policy at the Soil Association. And finally, Simon Billing is Executive Director at Eating Better. So welcome to all of our panelists. Firstly, perhaps in turn, I can ask our panel to briefly summarize what does better meat mean to you and how do you feel caterers currently perform in sourcing better meat? And Cleona, perhaps you can lead us off. Definitely, thanks very much, Nick. Um, meat, I suppose, the better meat to us at RSPCA Assured would be really meat that's from farms where the animals have been treated with respect and compassion throughout their whole lives. So both when on the farm, but also being given a humane death as well. Um, so I think that's really the, the kind of key to better meat for us. Um, and in terms, I suppose, of caterers and food service and where performance is right now, I think 
it's definitely, as you touched on, a little bit behind where you would right. see in a retailer. Um, yeah. But I think particularly, there, as you've mentioned, there are a lot of groups that actually are doing a lot, but not necessarily talking about it as much as they could be. So I think definitely there's a big opportunity to talk about the positive sourcing commitments that are there a lot more too. Great, thank you. Simon, I, I mentioned in my presentation, Eating Better, Sourcing Better Guide. Um, you know, without going into too much detail, what, what are the key principles from your perspective in terms of what better meat looks like? And, and do you see much of that being sourced by food service operators currently? Nick, you do, you've done an excellent summary of our, our report. I mean, we've taken a number of impact areas that you touched on and said, well, how, how do we address all of these in the whole across the supply chain, working with farmers as retailers and food service companies? and use those proxy certifications that we have to really start to deliver those. Um, um, I think it's possible. Um, is there much going on? Not really. And I think uh, food service is, is definitely much further behind retailers. Um, perhaps they just don't have the, the staff or the, the ability within that. But I think food service, there's a long way to go on this agenda. In, in trying to translate the action that, that sort of around better into those sort of purchase, purchasing decisions and what's landing up on the menu. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Rob, from your perspective, um, as I mentioned, the Soil Association yesterday put out uh, your latest out to lunch survey, um, perhaps you can just touch on the results from that and, and how to what extent it aligns with the Soil Association's definition of better meat. Yeah, well, I think if you look across the the, the multiple criteria that, that Eating Better outlined in their in their report on, on better meat, um, you consistently find that uh, organic is, is the closest proxy. So organic incorporates higher welfare, but it also looks down the supply chain at what those animals are eating. It asks whether the production system is benefiting um, nature um, and it brings antibiotics and a whole host of other criteria in. So um, uh, you don't have to be certified organic to be producing good meat, but organic certification is the, the clearest proxy, we think, um, for that multi-criteria approach. Um, with regards to what's going on in the high street, yes, we looked at um, children's menus at 20 of the most popular um, restaurant chains. Um, and found that while there is some movement towards uh, less meat, more diverse protein options, um, very few chains are, are sourcing exclusively British meat, let alone higher welfare or, or organic. Um, Oaxaca was the only um, chain serving higher welfare meat, um, and only three of the 20 that we looked at were, were sourcing exclusively from Britain, so a long way to go. But we have seen um, progress in the public sector through the Food for Life scheme, where, where caterers um, in some of the most deprived areas of the country, actually, are serving RSPCA assured and organic meat in, um, uh, on their menus. And thanks, Rob. And, and Kevin, from your perspective, um, you know, as I mentioned, WSH sees the way you source meat as a source of competitive advantage. So, so perhaps you can just briefly share what does that look like to you? What does better meat look like to you? And why do you think it's uh, a source of competitive advantage to you as a business? Uh, yeah, absolutely, Nick. Well, I think first and foremost, it's about supporting UK farms. Um, where possible, we do work directly with farmers. Um, and I think having those strategic relationships, longer term relationships, which allows those those farmers to, to invest in, in animal welfare is important. Uh, but like you touched on, there are a lot of complexities within the food service supply chain. And it's, it's not always possible to go direct. So I think it's working in partnership with our catering butchers as well um, in order to be able to to deliver that great thanks kevin just a reminder that uh, for anyone viewing the feed via youtube please do feel free to add comments and questions into the chat um, and i can then ask those to the panel um clearly we're in the middle of a, a key climate summit, COP26 in Glasgow, world leaders meeting to, to you know, hopefully advance the, the progress towards meeting that 1.5 emissions target. Um, I want to reflect on briefly on the government's net zero strategy. 
which barely mentions food systems generally, and it certainly doesn't mention meat in the context of reducing meat consumption. So why do we feel that meat remains such a political hot potato? And, and does this make it even more important for businesses to take the lead? Simon, perhaps I can come to you first on that. Uh, thank you, Nick. I think one of the key challenges that we all face is awareness between the environmental impact and the broader impacts of meat uh, at public awareness is still remains very low. And I think politicians recognise that. So one of the things that we all need to be doing is thinking about building awareness, building awareness around some of the nuances um, and building the awareness around the impacts of the way we produce and consume food. What's become very clear, and we hear that from the closest advisors from government, whether that's the Climate Change Committee or the National Food Strategy, that we do need a big reduction in meat consumption. And I think where we all agree is that these advisors are looking for caterers uh, to, to help lead the charge, to help us to all, as we would say, eat better, less meat, and shift the standard of the meat that we do eat away from extractive systems, intensive systems of agriculture, to more regenerative systems where animals and livestock are part of that system, part of the solution. So across all the impact areas that we've looked across, Nick, and they're all negative and they're all pretty grim, whether that's climate change, antimicrobial resistance, biodiversity loss, by shifting to the right meat, and produced in the right ways, you can turn a lot of those into positives. And I think that's that's part of the exciting challenge and story that we've got ahead and a journey in the next five years. And I think that's where we need to move and we need to move very quickly. And there's gonna be increasing scrutiny on this agenda over the next few years. Thanks, Simon. Kevin, from a business perspective, is, what more would you like to hear from governments uh, on, on the issue of, of food systems uh, but, and, and consumption and diets more generally? Do you think we're getting enough uh, leadership from government or, or actually are you quite happy as a business to be setting the agenda? No, I don't. I think there needs to be more support at a government level. I think, I think now is the right time. Um, I mean, you, you touched on before, I think. We're starting to see out in the marketplace now that that our potential customers and our existing customers are, are asking us the question about our supply chain, about where we're sourcing food from. It is helping us to to win and retain business um, by doing that. And I think that message needs reinforcing. Thanks, Kevin. Cleona, perhaps I can come to you on the issue of trade, um, which again we we picked up on in the report and we note how food service can be a route to market for imported meat produced to lower standards than are required in the UK. And I wonder, from RSPCA Shorts perspective, is, is there a concern that trade deals with the likes of Australia and New Zealand and future trade deals, mm -hmm. if they don't contain those guarantees around imports meeting UK production standards, some of those issues could be exacerbated in future. Definitely, Nick. And I think, you know, there's we definitely have significant concerns about the recent trade deals and that there isn't protection for the UK welfare standards in there. Because I think, as you touched on earlier, there is a concern that we're just going to end up importing a lot of uh, lower quality and lower welfare meat from abroad. Um, and I think, obviously, there's that particular concern about that going to, into the food service sector, particularly because of the lack of need for labelling at the moment, whereas it's a little bit harder to get into the retail chain, or at least customers are more aware of what they're purchasing in, the, in those chains there. I think we're definitely particularly concerned about the, the Trade and Agriculture Commission at the moment, not having any specific animal welfare expertise there as well. So, you know, there's a real call at the moment to say that they do want to support the welfare standards of, of the UK, but there's no protections being built in place for that. For that. Great, thanks Cleona. In the report, as I mentioned, we, we reference a piece of work um, carried out by the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission around sort of what a sustainable diet looks like um, from a shift to agroecological farming methods. And it, and it actually shows red meat 
levels of consumption tend to remain quite stable in this country. And that's actually chicken and pork where those reductions um, are, are most substantial. So, so Rob, uh, you know, does that align with um, the Soil Association's uh, perspective on what a diet, a UK diet would look like um, that would better align with our, I guess, the, the capacity of our of our land to, to to sustain those diets? Yeah, absolutely. The the issue isn't um, meat per se, it's meat produced in industrial systems and the overwhelming majority of the uh, the meat produced in those systems in the UK is, is uh, chicken and pork. Um, and chicken makes up roughly 50% of all the meat we eat. It's the meat type that's um, the cap wearing the capita consumption is rising year on year. Um, we're eating more and more of it. Um, uh, and if you look at what um, the, the big picture, if you um, take out those uh, damaging soya crops, um, uh, you, you remove those from the supply chain, you look at the availability of sustainable feed uh, and you rebalance animal populations accordingly, then um, then the most significant shift in, in consumption that we need to see is away from chicken and pork. And we do, there is some some decline in red meat, uh, in beef and, and lamb required as well, but it's it's really the, the industrial systems that should be the focus of our attention. Great, thank you. Um, this question of trade-offs um, that, you know, if you look through an emissions lens, you might get one answer on what's the most sustainable animal protein. If you look through a uh, welfare or biodiversity lens, you might get another answer. How can businesses manage those trade-offs? Um, you know, it, it, it's, it, it's not easy for scientists to agree, for academics to agree. So, so from a business perspective, how how can they manage those kind of trade-offs? Simon, you've obviously attempted to to look at that through the sourcing better guide, but but it's difficult, isn't it? Yes, but first front foot with less. So ultimately, if you're looking at in in any way into this conversation around better meat, it has to start with less meat. So, and then that will give you some flex and some ability to, to look at the, the better side, which will, that, that delivers you both opportunities around animal welfare, around climate change, around nature. Um, so those broader environmental and animal welfare, and as, as our other panelists have talked to, there are proxies out there that, that, that you can start and you can build off. So, I think there's there's a lot of opportunity. I think there's a potential inertia, Nick, of sort of saying, "Oh, we can't do anything. This is so difficult. We're going to get hit from one side." We know our we know our customers care about animal welfare. We know they care about deforestation. But there is a way of driving through that. But you need to start with the less. Great, thank you, Simon. Um, just looking through the chat box, um, lots of comments from Tony Goodger. Thank you, Tony. For those, um, I won't wrestle through them, but I think everyone can see them um, for themselves. But there is a question from Matthew Melton um, for Kevin specifically. He says 26 of the UK's top 40 catering businesses signed up to the Better Chicken commitment. Um, why, why not WSH? Um, what, what, what's your view in terms of that, Kevin? Is it just you've gone in a different direction or what, why not the Better Chicken commitment specifically? So we are in discussion with Compassion and World Farming about signing up to, to the Better Chicken commitment. And I guess we're on that, that journey with them. Um, so it, it is something that, that WSH are, are looking at. Um, and it's not that we're not going to sign up to that. It's just that we are talking through it with the uh, like I say, with Compassion and World Farming. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Any further questions in the box? I'm scrolling through now and I can't see any obvious ones. Um, okay. Well, look, that's been terrific. I think um, in terms of the Q&A, thank you all for participating, to Rob, to Kevin, to Simon, to Cleona. Um, please do go away 
and read the report. It's, uh, you know, I'm obviously biased, but I think it's a, uh, a really useful summary of where the food service sector is in terms of better meat and it's uh, on the road to sourcing better meat and how to overcome some of the challenges associated with that. Uh, the report, I believe, will be available to download from one o'clock today. And um, I shall now pass back to Charlie to conclude the session.